Picture in your mind that movie scene where silently and without words, the images cause your throat to begin to tighten up and choke with that cold burn and your insides begin to squirm and you look this way and that way to see who's watching because you're going to be embarrassed. Your eyes are about to gush forth with a gallon of tears rolling down your cheeks. Why does this happen? Our spirits feed on truth. More than facts, more than knowledge, there are pure threads of meaning whose origin is from God. And when our minds feed on God's word, we share an understanding with God which brings us together to really, truly know God. But our souls feed on pictures, objects that represent our feelings and emotions. And God is the master artist of these pictures. He knows how to paint pictures of love that will affect our hearts. Through God's pictures, we experience his love. Later, we'll be observing the Lord's Supper. And as we often do in this, in this ordinance, we focus on Jesus's take, eat, and drink ye all of it commands. But tonight, let's focus instead on the my body broken for you and my blood poured out for you, pictures of God's love. We rarely start the Lord's Supper as Jesus probably did with a dinner plate sized cracker of unleavened bread about an inch thick with coarse, of coarse grain. But had we been there when Jesus had his Lord's Supper, he would have taken a cracker that big and broken it in two with a loud crack, like a breaking bone. And then he would have taken the pieces and fractured them still farther and farther into smaller pieces, finally arriving at a piece that's just perfect for you. Handing it to you, he would say, this is my body, broken for you. And we rarely start the Lord's Supper with a soft-skinned leather bottle of red wine, squeezed to squirt messily from a small opening where a stream of blood-red liquid uh, splashes into a cup and splatters on the table crimson stains. Well, as the wine drains from the bottle, filling the cup, Jesus turns and says, This is the New Testament in my blood poured out for you. Blood draining from open wounds on head, back, arms, and feet. Running down the cross, pools of blood. Our Savior growing fainter and weaker as the life is emptied from him. The price paid to redeem us from the bondage of sin. John chapter 13 verses 1 through 17 presents us with these two pictures of God's love and still one more that, that we're going to see tonight on Good Friday. Heavenly Father, I pray, guide us by your spirit to experience and feel the pictures of your love painted for us on Good Friday. This I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come and that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. There is no doubt that Jesus demonstrated his love to the disciples many times with pictures of love over the past three years. But now that time is running out, his goal is intensified. He now is going to demonstrate love to his disciples in full living color. To the end is a very rare phrase, but most understand it to mean something like this. Loving, he loved them with the fullness of love. During supper, Jesus got up from supper and laid aside his garments. And taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. To paint a picture of love for the disciples, Jesus interrupts the Passover service. The image's impression will last longer in the minds of the disciples since it's being painted oddly out of place. Jesus' actions, performed without words, captures the disciples' attention immediately. The room goes silent and curiosities are now on high alert to discover the mystery of what Jesus is about to do. The disciples are lying down at the supper table. Jesus is standing up. The disciples are holding food, vegetables, bread, lamb, and Jesus is holding a towel. The disciples are wrapped comfortably in their robes. Jesus has removed his robe and wrapped himself with a rag around his waist. In Jewish culture, your feet were like the tires of your car. They took you everywhere, through the mud, through the dung, through the dirt and sand. And you could always take your sandals off at the door, but your feet would still be filthy and smell like a barn. Well-to-do hosts would command a household servant to wash the feet of the guests as they arrived. But without a servant, who should do the washing? 
perhaps the uh, youngest disciple, perhaps the disciple with the least amount of money, perhaps the disciple that was called last to join the band. And where are the women? Why aren't they doing their job? All the disciples, even the least of them, were in an elevated class of chosen ones, far above the demeaning task of foot washing. Yet, who picks up the basin and the towel? Jesus, the party's VIP, does the washing. Jesus washed Peter's feet, the impetuous guy who divides people up into neat layers with the important and valuable ones on the top and the disposable peasants and serfs on the bottom. He'll get another lesson about this disgusting habit of prejudice later in the book of Acts. Jesus washed Doubting Thomas's feet, the guy who bolted when Jesus was crucified because he thought the whole plan had come crumbling to the ground. Jesus washed Matthew's feet, likely the richest guy at the meal, wearing the best clothes of the bunch, purchased with the money he extorted from taxes collected from his Jewish community. Jesus washed Nathaniel's feet, the guy who couldn't be caught dead following around some native from the notorious town of Nazareth. Jesus washed James and John's feet, the two guys whose mother advised Jesus to set her sons on thrones to his left and right in the kingdom. Jesus washed Judas Iscariot's feet, who in just a few moments would dismiss himself early from the meal to betray his master for a mere 30 pieces of silver. Judas may have been the disciple that betrayed Jesus, but every one of these disciples will abandon him in just a few hours. These are the men Jesus humbled himself beneath. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you as an example that you also should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is the one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. We've skipped over the conversation Jesus had with Peter. There's always someone who will try to smear your picture. But nobody expected Jesus, the master, the teacher, the Lord, to cast away his greatness and supremacy to perform the function meant for slaves. God's love becomes the least to serve others like kings. And how many of these men were worthy of the service Jesus gave them? None of them. God's love is absolutely unconditional. Would the disciples have learned this lesson if Jesus had just stopped the party and started talking? No, this picture is a picture Jesus embedded directly into their souls. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Pictures like these from Jesus himself completely eliminate ignorance. You can't walk away from an art exhibition like this one without a far better understanding of divine love and our responsibility to walk in it. Was there a single disciple there who dared ask Jesus, would you please show me that picture one more time? I don't think I get it. And is there anyone here right now who still thinks this principle is a little bit fuzzy? Friends, we all know what Jesus was getting at. The question is now, are we going to be blessed or not? Obey the lesson framed in these pictures and God promises us we will be blessed. Is there anyone here who really wants to discover what Jesus has in store for those who disobey? Tonight, before we observe the Lord's Supper together, let's have a virtual foot washing. Wander through Jesus' picture gallery with me again and let's ask our hearts those obvious probing questions. Is there anyone here tonight who could not Stop the service right now. Interrupt the conclusion right now in this message and wash everyone's feet. Now don't raise your hand. Don't go rushing for the door. Don't go rushing for the kitchen even to grab a basin and towel. But just stew on that for a minute. Would it be too awkward for you? Would some sort of fear or embarrassment overpower your desire to be loving and obedient? Is there anyone here in this room tonight who is too important to stain their reputation by stooping this low? Do you believe this job is beneath your dignity and would you fear what people would say about you tomorrow when they find out what you did at church tonight? Is there anyone in this room willing to stop the service and humble yourself to this degree, but eventually you'd come across a person sitting in a pew who you'd feel too uncomfortable to wash their feet? In fact, is there someone who is not here right now whose feet you couldn't wash? Would scars, animosity, unhealed offenses, insult, and bitterness stop you? 
Lastly, is there anyone in this room who would get up and leave if the wrong person knelt before you to wash your feet? Just like those silly Mayo Clinic questionnaires, if you answered yes to any one of these questions, then you need to have a serious talk with Jesus tonight. If you need my help, by all means, I'll be there to help you. You can come talk to me. But this is so important. Your blessing is conditional upon your attitude. Your discomfort at washing someone's feet or having your feet washed by someone else is a clue that bitterness still be, may be there right in your soul. Your soul will never experience peace as long as you are still bitter toward that prejudiced friend who misjudged you because of your family, nationality, or hometown. That doubter who never believes you'll ever amount to anything. That person who avoids you because of who you keep as friends. Those people who look down their noses at you from their high and mighty pride. And that backstabber whose disloyalty cuts you to the heart. There's always going to be people like this, but you know the drill. To heal the bitterness of your soul, you must forgive. Obey God's example of love, and his love will shield you from all their harm and empower you to lovingly wash their feet in service for the kingdom. Remember, Jesus washed every ugly soul ever born with his broken body and shed blood from the cross. The master says, go and do the same. Heavenly Father, prepare our hearts, purify us now as we worship you in the Lord's Supper on this Good Friday. For I pray in Christ's name, amen.